much for attending the sixth and final webinar in the Zero Energy Ready Home series. My name is Jess Hoover, and I am the Climate Action Director for the High Country Conservation Center. Um, this series is sponsored by the Colorado Energy Office and the High Country Conservation Center, and we are a resource conservation nonprofit up in Summit County. And we've been very involved with supporting our community's new sustainable building codes. HC3 provides the energy consulting services listed on this slide to help local building professionals. We've also been organizing educational workshops like this one to help folks learn what's required by the new codes in our community. We also partnered with the Colorado Energy Office, Energy Smart Colorado, and Deeper Green Consulting to sponsor a local HERS Raider training course so that we've got new HERS Raiders ready to support your projects come next week, July 1st, effective date of the Sustainable Codes. Today's webinar is also sponsored by Walking Mountain Science Center, and Nikki Maylene is going to take a moment to introduce their work. So Nikki, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi, thanks Jess. Um, thanks everybody just for being here today. It was nice to be able to sponsor, co-sponsor this webinar with Jess um, and the Colorado Energy Office. We are Energy Smart Colorado at Walking Mountain Science Center, so we service uh, Vale and the Eagle River Valley area. We do many of the same things that Jess just mentioned on the previous slide. Um, home energy assessments, business energy walkthroughs, energy coaching. We have lots of different rebates. Um, this, this year we have some expanded incentives. So if anyone's doing work in the Eagle Valley area, we are doing some increased incentives uh, for beneficial electrification is also, also some increased incentives for um, income qualified solar on, on homes that are income qualified. So um, be in touch with myself or Matt, our contact information is there, 328-8777 or energy at walkingmountains.org. We'd love to talk to you about all the incentives available um, and all the things we do. We'll have more trainings coming up as well. So stay tuned and enjoy the webinar. Great, thanks Nikki. In addition to providing trainings like this one, the Colorado Energy Office has also created a code adoption toolkit that reviews cost implications of changing code cycles, the benefits of changing codes or updating codes, and other compliance resources and more. They are also currently working on a troubleshooting guide that will cover I-code conflicts and alignments, clarifications, and paths of compliance. And you can find all of that information on the Energy Office's website. Today's webinar will review cold climate assemblies. The webinar is being recorded and the recording will be sent out to all attendees. If you have any issues with audio, please write that in the chat and you can find that function by hovering over the bottom of your WebEx window and clicking on the chat bubble icon. I've muted everyone's lines to reduce background noise, but sometimes WebEx does act up, so please make sure that you're muted on your end as well. That said, we do want to encourage questions, so please feel free to use the chat function to enter questions um, and we'll make sure that we get to them all at the end of the presentation. So today's presenter is Robbie Schwarz. Robbie has been a champion of the building science industry for over 20 years. As principal of Build Tank Inc., Robbie works with builders of all sizes to ensure that their high performance homes are efficient, healthy, and resilient. So with that, thanks again for being here and take it away, Robbie. Great, thank you very much, I uh, appreciate that. And uh, as usual, we have a lot of material to go through today, so we'll pretty much jump uh, straight in here. Um, beginning with looking at some, some history of some of the buildings that we looked at, because uh, we see that there are some buildings that have lasted for an incredible amount of time. Uh, the building on the left here is from the fifth millennia before BC uh, in France. A stone building, and then we have the Taos Pueblo. That's the longest continuously inhabited building, over a thousand years of inhabitants. So, our question, you know, when we're talking about specific climates and specific buildings, is you know why certain buildings last so long over time. Uh, the the picture on the left here is a picture in Washington D, Washington D.C., which is a old stone house. 
that was built in 17, 7, 1765. And then we have a traditional Denver Square built here in Denver that was built in 1910. Uh, all these structures uh, kind of share one thing in common, and that really is this notion of huge drying potential here. Uh, when we kind of move forward in time, we see that our housing, the way that we're currently building housing um, has been around for quite some time. Uh, since the uh, mid 1800s, uh, we were using stick framed uh, houses and we're currently you know, doing basically the same thing. So we haven't really progressed a lot in terms of the technology of how or what we're building our houses with uh, we're de they're definitely engineered to be stronger and uh, and safer and whatnot. Uh, but really, the big thing that's changed over time uh, in this you know little over you know 150 years or so is that the number of people involved in the construction process has changed pretty dramatically. So in when stick framing began, it was probably a small family business, uh, some neighbors maybe coming together to build a house for. Uh, another neighbor, but usually it's it's really a, a small group of people that took it from foundation all the way through finished carpentry. Uh, the National Association of Home Builders recently did a study, and they saw that on average, uh, you know, ten to twenty trade partners are coming in with ten to ten or more people in each trade partner category. And so we're getting up in the range of 300 or more people touching a house today. And the other thing that we see is that it's segmented. So instead of taking it, you know, one or two people, one to 10 people taking it from foundation through finished carpentry, we get uh, a group of people that are specialized in a specific means of construction um, there. So our question ultimately is, you know, how do we get a hundred year old house? How do we get a house that in the past has been drafty, uncomfortable, but yet incredibly durable, how do we get that house again? And, and what we realize is that it's drying potential is the driver there. That's the commonality of longevity is the ability for that house to drive. And our expectations of our houses have changed pretty dramatically. So we're changing that drying potential there. We have uh, these, expectations of comfort, uh, expectations of durability, expectations of safety and indoor air quality uh, and efficiency in our houses. So we need to better understand applied building science. We need to better understand this notion of moisture flow, of thermal flow and airflow in our houses. And if we break that down, these expectations down in a little bit and try to understand what's happening, we see that our, our housing is changing right in front of our eyes in Northwest Denver, where I live, uh, we're seeing houses being scraped and new houses being built. So these these houses from the housing stock of uh, early the early 1900s uh, to the mid 1900s are and whole city blocks are being scraped and, and new housing is being built. Um, and the reason again is because we our expectations of our houses have changed pretty dramatically. And one example of that is if we take comfort. So in the picture on the right here, we have a house that was built in the 1910 range, 19, early 1900 range, and then a house next door that was built in, in 2020, really, just, just was completed um, here. And if we think about comfort in 1900s, in the early 1900s, we realized that our grandparents who might li have lived in that house were willing to supplement uh, the comfort that the house itself was not able to achieve. So they were willing to put on a sweater in the wintertime. They were willing or realized that they might actually have to do some work to heat that house. They might have to uh, stoke a stove or, or put some coal on a, a coal uh, furnace or do some type of work to, to ensure that that house uh, stayed warm in the wintertime. Versus our, our expectation today of comfort literally is being able to walk around in our underwear from room to room and floor to floor and be quote unquote comfort comfortable and we've had to do some pretty amazing things in order to achieve that goal we've we've changed the way that we insulate our houses the way that we heat and cool our houses uh, the way that we design our houses all of these things which have 
has changed also the drying potential of our houses. So we really need to think about the applied building science and, and ultimately how these things, so these modern expectations have changed the way that we create the enclosures of our houses and the goals for those enclosures. So we not only have structural integrity, which is, that's, that's in itself has changed now, uh, our engineering for wind loads and and uh, uh, earthquakes and other type of natural uh, forces on our houses has changed pretty pretty dramatically. Uh, fire integrity, durability, this notion of long term durability. You know what does that mean today? In the past, you know we we think of this hundred year old house. Are we still able to achieve that and also have a healthy indoor environment, a comfortable indoor environment, an energy efficient house? So ultimately, when we're trying to create separation, uh, we're trying to create uh, predictability and control uh, of that enclosure separation, that separation, separating the conditioned space from the ambient outdoors out there. And these expectations that we have of our houses is what's driving the change in how we're doing it. We also need to understand how our industry has changed and it's changed pretty dramatically over time as well. You know, we call ourselves builders potentially, uh, or we work in the building industry, but how many of us are actually out there swinging a hammer and doing the actual construction of the house? So are builders really more leaders of change and innovation? Uh, to be able to build houses that meet the core expectations that people have of their houses. And as leaders of, of this change in innovation, we really need to understand systems thinking and applied building science to ensure that we're not going to be creating houses that are going to fail uh, shortly after they're built, uh, that they not only can meet the expectations, but they have great longevity. Uh, because the biggest thing uh, that's wasteful is a house that's going to start degrading as almost as soon as it's starting to be occupied there. So we need to understand this, this notion of performance. Uh, are the things uh, being installed in the house, that's part of the equation uh, to create a long time durable house, but have they been installed so they actually perform and work is the other part of the equation that we have to always think about. So is it there and does it work is a question, especially from a verification and, and inspection side of the equation in, in our industry to ensure that things are, are not only there, but they're, they've been installed so they actually function and work as, as planned here. So to, to integrate all this, we need to con, uh, start this conversation early and, and continually uh, learn from what we're doing in our houses. So help educate our and prepare our trade partners for the, the ultimate goals of the house. Do we even tell uh, the trade partners what the goal of that particular house is? It could The goal could be just achieving basic code compliance. It could be achieving a zero energy ready home, uh, which is code now in, in some areas like, like uh, some account, or it could be something something different there. But Whatever the goal is, we have to actually let our trade partners know and potentially uh, adapt our scope of work documents so that everybody understands how their piece of the puzzle interacts to achieve that ultimate goal. So what is the objective of the house? And then when we design, construct, test, evaluate, hopefully we learn from what we've built and bring that back into the design process. And if we're not learning right after after we've completed a house, at a minimum, we need to learn if we're having to go back and do any type of warranty on that house, we need to learn from that and, and take that back to the design so that we're not repeating issues over and over again uh, in our assemblies there. So again, this notion of applied building science and systems thinking really uh, are the keys to successfully implementing a program like the DOE Zero Energy Ready Home Program, or just building a house that's going to be that 100-year-old house again uh, in our current uh, uh, climate and, and meeting those core expectations that people have of their houses. So when we're talking about applied building science, primarily we're trying to understand the science around airflow, uh, heat flow and thermal flow, and how to get control and predictability of airflow, heat flow, and moisture flow in our houses. 
And we've talked about this over the course of this, this uh, series. We're not going to go into great depth uh, as we did in the past, but, but this fundamental notion of control and predictability of heat flow, thermal flow, and moisture flow are, are, are always what need to be in the back of our mind here. And this notion of systems thinking. And systems thinking really revolves around this one word synergy, where two or more things come together to achieve something greater than what could be achieved on their own. Uh, insulation and air barriers are an example of that. Fan and ductwork are an example of that. There are lots of examples of, of how two components are coming together in our houses uh, to create not only aesthetically beautiful homes, but homes that are comfortable from room to room, safe, durable, and resilient, uh, energy efficient, and ultimately cost effective. So how do we meet those core expectations that people have? We need to have this notion of systems thinking generated and, and used in, in our construction process here. So the building system integration, again, revolves around how do we integrate the structure uh, with the systems in our house, with the enclosures in, in our house, and ultimately in the specific climate that we're building in. So how do we apply uh, building science and systems thinking uh, into these different things, into the structure, the systems, and the closure to bring those things together in the particular climate that we're building in and for the people that are ultimately building or ultimately going to occupy that house. Because the reality is that the people are the big wild card in this e equation. The people are the things that are going to do, are going to be unpredictable. So if we can get control and predictability of the structure and the systems and the and the enclosures in the particular environment that we're building in, we can overcome the unpredictability of the people in our houses here. And we can ultimately build a high performance building that's going to last and perform over time. So this was an interesting um, diagram that I came across that reflects the fact that buildings behave as systems, much like the greater ecosystem, ecosystem that we live in. And change, if you change one part of that system, it has a pretty big impact on the other parts of those systems. So again, starting early in the design integration process to think about how we're putting the system together and understand how it's integrated with all the other systems in our houses. And then ultimately, if during the construction process, we change something, we need to understand the impact of that change uh, to the other things and the other uh, goals that we have of that particular house that we're building here. So the code starts us on this process of applying building science to our house by really concentrating on the building thermal envelope of our house and ultimately the assemblies that we're going to use to uh, create that building thermal envelope of our, of our house. So the code says that the building thermal envelope needs to be, be depicted on our construction documents. And it gives us a definition of the building thermal envelope that helps us realize that the thermal envelope is an assembly of things that we put together to create this barrier between conditioned space and unconditioned space. So it's that demarcation line that separates where we want to live and have control and predictability from the unpredictable stuff that's outside that building envelope, the ambient outdoor air, the ambient outdoor dirt, other things that, that are surrounding that structure there. So uh, the, the point of this depiction on the building envelope is to begin at the design phase by in essence putting that red or blue uh, pen on your sectional drawing and being able to draw a line around and define that thermal envelope without picking that, that pen off the paper uh, there. Because the uh, whole idea is to have that continuity and integrity of the building thermal envelope all the way around the building envelope. So I take it and the, the, the air barrier system can be inside, it can be outside. And really the building thermal envelope is the integration of our thermal barrier and our air barrier system uh, working together in that synergistic way to separate conditioned space from unconditioned space there. So I might have 
this assembly of things that are coming together. So at, at some points, my pri primary air barrier might be on the outside. In some points, it might be on the inside. In some points, it might be within that enclosure assembly there. And in some cases, it might be really difficult to determine where that boundary is going to be. So you're going to have to make a choice. And third party folks that are out inspecting, code officials that are out inspecting houses can help you determine how to successfully um, integrate and, and achieve that thermal envelope of the house after you've made a choice of where do you actually want it to be. Uh, this picture, um, you know, it's, it's hard to define exactly where that thermal envelope is going to be. So um, if, but on site, we could determine that and we could say oh you might need a top plate here a bottom plate here some attic side sheathing there uh, you might need different components you might add to the framing here to be successful uh, but the ultimately it starts with that decision where do you want the thermal envelope to be where is that separation that boundary between conditioned space and unconditioned space and how are we going to construct it to meet these core expectations that people have and to create control and predictability of the airflow, thermal flow, and moisture flow inside of our houses. Now, one of the ways that we do this and, and create this sound building thermal envelope is by understanding what our, our, the components of our systems uh, can do and can't do. So for example, I've got an insulated cavity here, but the insulation itself its primary goal is to resist the flow of energy from warm to cold. Uh, so it's this conductive uh, portion of energy that's moving directly uh, through the material here. And uh, the insulation I'm putting in there is trying to resist that conduction or, or slow that conduction uh, from it. You generally speaking from inside our houses to outside our houses in the winter season. It, it does not do a good job, especially if it's fibrous material, at resisting the flow of air through the material. So in this synergistic thinking process from a systems thinking process, uh, I need to have an air barrier system uh, in connection with my thermal barrier system in order to have a system that can actually control thermal flow in my houses there. So when we're talking about cavity insulation, you're gonna hear more and more about six-sided enclosures uh, in our cavities, so we're talking about wall systems and floor systems primarily here, uh, because most insulations, especially fibrous insulations, uh, can't stop the movement of air. So when we see it uh, being installed in a way where it's thought to be able to stop the movement of air, we need to take a second look and ensure that it's actually been installed to, to work and perform. So in some cases, you might have to uninstall a fiberglass bat that's filling a hole because that bat itself is not going to uh, stop air from moving through that hole, even though I can no longer see through that hole. Now, the other thing that we need to talk about and review a little bit here is air and air movement. And again, we're going to do it pretty briefly, but I want to bring back this concept of Thinking about air as a freight train, it is a cargo moving mechanism. It moves cargo from point A to point B. And the primary thing that air carries is heat, moisture, and pollutants. And the problem is that air can randomly drop off its cargo. And that's a problem because if it's randomly dropping its cargo inside of a wall assembly, for example, um, we can get moisture, condensation, and other things uh, continually happening inside of an assembly. So uh, this is why we get this question uh, so often. Can a house be too tight? And the reality is that the answer to this question is no, uh, because primarily we're asking the wrong question. In order to gain that control and predictability, not only of airflow, but of also moisture flow and heat flow, we need to build our houses tight and we need to build them as tight as we possibly can. So the real question we should be asking is a question about ventilation. And in 99% of the time, our houses are underventilated. Now we're getting better and better as the IACC and other codes 
are starting to mandate whole house control mechanical ventilation, we're getting better and better at understanding the relationship between high, tight houses and controlled whole house mechanical ventilation, as well as spot ventilation in our houses. But we need to always remember that um, the ventilation system needs to be uh, linked to the particular climate we're building in and uh, the type of house we're building in as well to get that control and predictability. So uh, we're doing a better job of asking the question. We're doing a better job of understanding the question of ventilation and understanding the connection between building tight and ventilating right because airflow, again, is carrying that cargo of heat, moisture, and pollutants, and we want that control and predictability of that airflow so that we can, can clean the air or we can transport that air directly from the inside to the outside uh, uh, before it's able to drop its load inside of a building assembly there. So ultimately, again, we're all about gaining control. And I use McDonald's as an example of predictability because if I go to McDonald's in Summit County, in Denver or in Paris, France, um, I can get a Big Mac sandwich there, Big Mac hamburger, and I know exactly what I'm going to get. It's, it's so predictable from McDonald's to McDonald's that I know what I'm gonna get, I know what it's gonna taste like, I know how I'm gonna feel afterwards. All those things are, are so predictable. So that's the type of control and predictability that we want in our houses for airflow, moisture flow, and thermal flow as well. Here. Um, and that brings us to the point that air and vapor or air and moisture that's carried with air, they're one. They're one and the same here because, again, that's the load. And so it's a big part of the load, and we need to understand what's ultimately happening with that moisture that's being carried by air. So in our climate, we know that air, ca air carries water and that water vapor moves potentially in, independent of air as well, from higher concentrations to lower concentrations or from warm to cold. Uh, there's this thing called vapor pressure that moves, uh, that moves moisture, much like uh, energy moves from hot to cold, it moves from higher concentrations to lower concentrations um, there. And then we have lots of sources of moisture inside of our houses from cooking and showers, people bringing plants inside or pets like fish, fish into our houses. Uh, some people like to um, cool their houses with swamp coolers, which, which work really well in dry climates, but it does increase the, the moisture content inside of our houses. And just building a tighter structure by itself will increase the moisture content in our houses. And that's one of the big reasons why we include, include ventilation, whole house control mechanical ventilation in our houses is to get that background control over the increased uh, moisture level in our houses that is caused just by building our houses tighter. So we need to understand this, this notion of relativity um, of humidity in our air. So relative humidity um, is in essence how air carries moisture around and it's it's based about on the amount of moisture held by air compared to the maximum amount that's possible that's what the relative part ultimately is when we get 100 percent saturation of that air that's when the moisture starts coming out in a physical water droplet uh, and that happens on surfaces it generally you know we don't often see rain inside of our um, houses, but that 100% saturation uh, we do see in the form of con condensation on specific surfaces there. So in housing, that's primarily how uh, we know our, our um, humidity level, our moisture level in the air is way too high here. So humidity um, is described in a couple different ways. So let's think first about humidity um, as a towel as a way to measure how how absorbent if you think of the towel as air in essence uh, you can think about how absorbent that towel is and it can give us an idea of 
um, the relative nature of humidity inside of our houses. So humidity, again, is the capacity of air to hold water vapor, and it's a function of ultimately of temperature. So if we think of humidity, we can think about how big the towel is and how much moisture uh, can that um, towel absorb uh, there before that moisture is going to start uh, just dripping out of that towel. So the warmer the air, the more moisture it can hold or the more water vapor it can hold. So in essence, the bigger that towel is. So if I had a dish towel and it gets saturated uh, versus a larger towel that gets saturated uh, is going to uh, be the relative nature, the percentage nature of uh, humidity here. So absolute humidity, again, is this how much moisture is in the air by weight. And then the relative humidity is the amount of water vapor present in the air expressed as a percentage of the amount needed to saturate that uh, air at the same temperature. So uh, how absorbent is that air at a, or that towel at a specific temperature before that uh, towel reaches 100% uh, humidity when the, when the towel would start leaking water out of the towel. It's no longer absorbent. It starts actually releasing moisture uh, in a droplet form out of the towel or out of the air in the form of condensation. So condensation is the most common form of moisture that we encounter in buildings. It's what we call repeated wetting of our assemblies. And repeated wetting of our assemblies are the things that destroy our assemblies over time. Um, the internal air, again, can have high levels of humidity due to the activity of the occupants, if they're cooking or breathing or, or having lots of plants uh, in the houses. And it creates that condensation. And the condensation, again, happens on surfaces. Uh, so if we look at, you know, we've all pulled out a soda can or a beer can and uh, seen condensation on the outside of that can here. But what's happening here, we've got condensation above this little line uh, that's shown on this Pepsi can. And we have, no, we have uh, no condensation above the line and we have condensation below the line. And what we learn from this uh, observation is that the surface temperature is a big element of the creation of condensation. So it's the relative amount of moisture that's in that air in relationship to temperature of the surfaces that create condensation uh, there. And so there are a couple ways that we can uh, think about how do we gain control and predictability of the formation of condensation in our houses. So just like adding a koozie to the can, if I raise the surface temperature of that can either by taking a sip and removing the liquid from one side of the can or by adding thermal insulation to that can, I've raised the surface temperature and I've, I've stopped the ability for condensation to on the surface of that, that can. So it, that's exactly what's happening when we think about adding uh, exterior foam insulation here. And we'll talk about that more. But the, the first thing we need to talk about is that surface of the can. Where in our houses do we have surfaces that are uh, consistently able to be at a temperature range where uh, condensation will form ultimately? And that generally happens at our framing members here. So, um, you know, a, a well framed house would minimize the amount of framing that we're putting into our assemblies. But either engineers or framers or others really believe that if one king stud is good, then two king studs is even better. And if two is good, then six might be better. And if six is good, well, why not stick 15 of them uh, into our wall assembly to hold up a window or a door or, or whatever uh, we're trying to hold up there. Uh, and often, you know, the, the people that are adding this wood to our assemblies don't understand the impact the, the true impact that it's having on our assemblies, not only from an efficiency perspective, but from a long term durability perspective. We're creating cold surfaces and those cold surfaces 
are where we get that repeated wetting and that repeated condensation. And it can turn up as ghosting on these assemblies. Now, ghosting is that condensation that's formed on the cold surface and that moisture on that cold surface is trapping or attracting dust that's in the air. And that dust starts building up on that cold surface. And because it's at the stud, it's creating lines on the interior drywall there. Um, I saw it, uh, you know, early in my career, I saw it on a house that was also backdrafting a um, gas fireplace. So there was carbon in the air and these lines were so black and dark. Uh, it was incredible in this house. And unfortunately, I wasn't smart enough at the time to take any pictures of it. Uh, so, uh, you know, this is this is what you can see, though, is something similar to this, but sometimes it gets pretty dramatic out there. You know, and what that that is an indication of is what we call thermal bridging. And thermal bridging basically takes the notion that the R value of that stud is significantly less than the R value of the insulation that's inside that cavity. And therefore, more energy is moving through the stud, conducting through the stud from higher concentrations to lower concentrations, then, then is able to conduct through the assembly itself. So we can do something about this notion uh, if we start thinking about advanced framing. So advanced framing is a technique to figure out how we can reduce the framing members inside of our homes. So the code has begun the process of codifying some things that are mandatory requirements to do in our homes. Uh, it's also a requirement uh, for Energy Star as well. Uh, so you, you, you know, two or three stud corners, uh, a lot of people don't understand that it's a mandatory requirement of the code to, to create that insulated corner so that you raise the surface temperature of that corner, not only from a conduction reduction perspective, but from a reduction of condensation potential uh, at, at those corners. And corners are not only on the exterior, it's also where interior walls meet exterior walls. So it would be a mandatory requirement to do some type of ladder blocking system or some type of continuous two by six uh, framing behind a two by four wall so that you can continuously insulate behind that corner there. Insulated headers are also called out by the IECC as a mandatory requirement. Uh, so uh, we're not seeing uh, engineers understand that very well. So it is something that we should point out that we need to engineer our houses with uh, the proper insulated header, which might mean that you can, you know, you continue to use a three ply header with a, some foam board in it to uh, use as a spacer instead of putting half inch uh, OSB or, or plywood between uh, the three ply header or you might move to a single ply header or a double ply header where you can blow or, or uh, put other types of insulation in the cavities that are created by that, pushing that header material to the outside um, there. Uh, interestingly enough, I, I just saw a house where they pushed it to the inside. And the problem with pushing the, a two ply header to the inside is that we often forget to insulate it from the outside before we put on our exterior sheathing there. I don't know if they've insulated the, the house that I just saw, uh, but that's the question is we don't know uh, there. So it's better if you're doing a two ply or one ply header uh, to push it to the outside so that we know that it's going to insulate correctly. We also see that the Energy Star takes, Energy Star program takes it a bit further, uh, talking about limiting framing at our windows and doors. Uh, and limiting framing means one pair, one pair of king studs per window opening, uh, one pair of jack studs per window opening, or, or really any opening uh, to the outside. Uh, additional jack studs only used as needed, and then cripple studs only used as needed as well um, there. Now, there will be some occasions where you need to add more framing, uh, and the engineer will be able to point that up. But the object is to reduce those exceptions as much as possible so that we can increase the uh, surface temperature 
of our uh, framing of our, our building envelope and reduce condensation. And especially with headers, we might need, we might not be able to uh, do a two ply header. We might have to do a large structural beam uh, for that header uh, to carry the load or something. Uh, but there's generally a way to insulate it. And we need to make sure that the engineers are on board and moving in the right direction. Um, Energy Star continues and they say that in climate zones uh, six through eight, that um, you don't necessarily have to go 16 inches on center if you can um, ensure that the insulated cavity is at least an R20 or above um, there. Um, however, if you go this route uh, with the Energy Star program, you are missing out on increasing the surface uh, temperature of those first condensing surfaces uh, at all the framing there. Uh, you also might consider building a double wall uh, there. And what this is doing is it creates cavity insulation, but it also creates a cavity inside of a cavity that is continuous there. So you can see uh, where the two, two two by fours line up in this picture, there's space between those two by fours in this uh, double walled assembly. And that would be continuous insulation. And that ultimately gives us what we call a thermal break from inside to outside. So we're raising the surface temperature of that inside framed surface where condensation might uh, be created there. Um, so moving from a, a 16 inch on center wall to a 24 inch on center wall, uh, takes out a significant amount of wood. Almost about a third of the of the studs can be uh, taken out if you do a careful uh, advanced framing design. It improves our whole wall R value because again, the stud has less R value than the cavity. And it also um, is generally a neutral cost if you're moving from a two by four wall assembly to a two by six wall assembly. Um, because uh, generally speaking, if you're going to do a um, uh, advanced framing, you're going to go to a two by six wall uh, if you're if you're normally using a two by four wall. Uh, other cost savings that have been pointed out is that uh, electricians and plumbers have fewer uh, studs to think about if they're pulling wire and having to drill studs. So you might get some cost savings for the installation of those uh, from those trade partners. And the ins insulator has fewer stud cavities to, to fill up as well. They're bigger, the same, the, you know, the surface area is roughly the same, uh, but uh, there are fewer cavities. So there might be some cost savings in the installation of insulation, electrical and plumbing uh, systems in, that, in our houses there. Uh, another part of advanced framing is the potential of going to a single top plate. A single top plate eliminates uh, hundreds of lineal feet of lumber in our houses. It further reduces that, that thermal bridging uh, in our houses. It increases cavity insulation, the amount that we can do it. It does require vertical framing alignment, however, which means that we have to be able to stack uh, the framing and, and bring the load down through the stack uh, all the way down uh, from the, our roof load to our foundation. So the roof truss needs to stack with the wall stud on the second floor and then needs to stack with the um, floor joists uh, between the first and second floor and needs to stack to the stud again on the first floor there. So you have a pathway all the way down the house from the roof to the floor. If you're going to do a single top plate, and even if you're not going to do a single top plate, uh, you might consider doing a wall layout that looks like this if you're doing advanced framing, because advanced framing um, is significantly different. And you tend to see a lot of framers add additional wood to the package. So if you tell them, where to start their framing layout and where each stud belongs in that wall layout there, then you can better ensure that you're going to get the true benefits of an advanced framing package that you, you, know, you spend something on this design process uh, to get the benefit of it. You want to ensure 
not only is it there, but is it performing to its maximum level there? Uh, this is an example of a, a you know, I think a pretty large addition that I did on my own house, and we we did advanced framing on this house uh, as well. You can see in the large wall, A-framed wall there, uh, there are no headers uh, in those windows because it's a non-load-bearing wall. Uh, so I could remove all the headers and just add cavity insulation. Some other things that you see people do is um, instead of going to 24 inch on center, they go from 16 to 19.2 on center. I, I haven't exactly figured out why they use that dimension, uh, but it, it seems to be a fairly common uh, dimension if you don't wanna go all the way to uh, 24 inch on center framing there. Uh, I've seen a lot of folks do everything from an advanced framing perspective, except stay with double top plates. Uh, staying with double top plates ultimately means that you don't have to stack your framing and that can be beneficial depending on um, uh, floor systems maybe you you want to go 24 inch on center in your wall system but you don't you want to stay at 16 inch on center for your floor so that you you can avoid bouncing floors or something like that um, so it's another other things to consider is how you can join uh advanced framing with with typical framing and still get the best structure that you possibly can um, otherwise you know the the traditional way that we talk about uh, lessening the uh, or increasing the surface temperature of our exterior building thermal envelope or, or what we often call our first condensing surface here which i'll show you in a second is by putting that foam sheathing on the outside of our buildings uh, there are a variety of ways to do it. There are a variety of ways to detail it so that we have the right control layers um, there. But considering uh, exterior foam sheathing, especially in our higher altitude climate zones, is something that we should really think about. Now, moisture, again, is this big um, thing that we're always thinking about because moisture, again, is the thing that ultimately destroys our houses over time. Here. So the, what this slide is really showing is that um, our codes and programs ultimately uh, have to understand that moisture is moving by two pathways. One is moisture that's moving with air, and the other is moisture that's moving through the pores of our materials uh, by the process of diffusion here. And diffusion is, again, mo air moving I'm sorry, moisture in its particle form moving directly through the pores of material, most often from higher concentrate, well, always from higher concentrations to lower concentrations, most often in Colorado because uh, from the inside to the outside of our houses because we generally have more moisture inside of our houses than we have outside of our houses. So it's, it's move, trying to move through the pores of the drywall and then ultimately out to the outside. And so when we talk about drying potential or, our, or that our houses breathe, we're talking about drying potential and, and the ability to allow that moisture to move through our materials and ultimately out by this process of diffusion here. So diffusion is based off of uh, vapor pressure where you have larger concentrations of moisture uh, separated by a boundary, a clear boundary, in this case drywall, uh, from lower concentrations of vapor. And that, that creates a, a moisture vapor pressure that's driving that, that vapor through the pores of the material from higher concentrations to lower concentrations. Again, it's also uh, governed by temperature and relative humidity out there. And what we've learned over time through a variety of experience, experience and experiments uh, is that vapor pressure uh, and vapor diffusion is a smaller transport mechanism than vapor that's moving with air. So we not only want to ensure that we uh, control vapor pressure, but we allow drying potential. We really want to control house tightness because that's the bigger mechanism for moisture to move from one side of our assembly to the other side of the assembly.
So when moisture gets into our assembly, in this picture, it's showing moisture getting into our assembly primarily by the process of diffusion. But remember, moisture can get into our assemblies by diffusion as well as air leakage. So when moisture gets into our assembly, it tends not to condense until it hits a surface that it can condense on. So the temperature uh, that that first condensing surface has um, could be also doubled in somewhere inside of the cavity, uh, but it's not going to change state from its vapor state to a liquid state until it actually hits a, hits a surface there. And one of the reasons we put foam on the outside to warm that surface temperature and, and reduce the amount of condensation or wetting that we're getting is that if I can keep the water in its vapor state for longer periods of time, it has an ability to dry back out of the assembly. So what do I mean by that is that it has the ability to diffuse back out of that assembly. It is not going to leave that assembly by air leakage. So again, the importance of creating that tight house, those tight assemblies to ensure that air isn't moving moisture in to our assemblies because it doesn't have the ability that air doesn't have the ability to carry that moisture back out of the assembly uh, in most cases. But it does have the potential to dry back out by the process of diffusing back out from higher concentrations to lower concentrations in our assembly there. So this uh, dew point uh, condensation chart is a simplified, what we call cyclometric chart. And what it basically tells me is that if I have conditions that are 35% relative humidity at 70 degrees air, that if I hit a surface that's at, at 40 degrees, I'm going to create a condensation. That is the dew point temperature where condensation will be created inside of my assembly there. So again, if I can raise the surface temperature above 40, I will not get condensation if I have 35% uh, relative humidity and 70 degree air in my houses. And you take that one example, how often do we see 35% relative humidity and 70 degree air in the winter time inside of our houses? You know, that's a pretty common uh, temperature range and pretty common relative humidity range that we see uh, in our houses in the winter uh, in Colorado here. So uh, again, foam sheathing could make a big difference here. Um, again, if we're using our building our assemblies correctly here, we've created an airtight assembly. <coughs> so we've lessened the amount of moisture that's going to get into our wall assemblies by air leakage. But if it does get into those assemblies, we have to figure out the drying potential of that assembly there. Otherwise, we're going to trap moisture into that assembly because we're also concentrating on trying to lessen the amount of moisture that can move into our assemblies by the process of diffusion. And the code generally focuses on that side of the equation. Now it's moved to focusing both on diffusion and air tightness, but we have to remember, do we really want to put a class one vapor retarder if we don't install it properly? And if we don't think about how to install it from an air leakage perspective. Okay, so let's think about the building thermal envelope. And there are parts of this building thermal envelope that are, are governed by the International Energy Conservation Code and other parts that are governed by the IRC or the International Residential Code. And both of these codes are integral to uh, the programs, the DOE Zero Energy Ready Home Program and Energy Star Program that help us figure out how we're going to build our assemblies here. Um, so a concept that has been uh, talked about for a while now, but that has really kind of come to its own during this COVID period through a lot of webinars that are happening out there um, now is this idea of control layers and thinking about these control layers uh, individually and in unison with each other. So um, the concept of the perfect wall has really brought this notion of control layers uh, to the forefront. And it's basically saying that we should keep outside, outside, and we should keep inside, out, inside. So if we have a clearly defined building thermal envelope, 
then we can keep the conditioning part inside everything that we want to condition to be comfortable in the winter and in the in the summer uh, inside our houses and keep everything else outside of our houses that are that are going to impact uh, that conditioned space and also impact the structure that's defining that conditioned space. So uh, it turns out that this perfect wall, why they call it a perfect wall, is that it works in every climate zone if you were to build it because we're able to control water, air, vapor, and heat flow. And we create durability, efficiency, and comfort in doing so. So this is an example of a house that did that. And it turns out that the perfect wall assembly is trying to put all of these control layers to the outside. So the cavity is not filled with insulation at all. And so you can see how they achieved that in this house um, there. Um, so let's talk about it a little bit more. For, if we look at the perfect wall, uh, we, we're going to look at uh, these control layers in order of importance. And we always want to start with water because water, again, is that thing that destroys houses over time. So we want to ensure that we keep water out of our out of our building assembly uh, so that it won't condense and won't create co uh, continual moisture damage inside of our houses. Next would be an air control layer. Next would be a vapor control layer, a thermal control layer. Um, and ultimately, from a perfect wall perspective, we're locating all of these things outside of the building envelope. And the other thing that we need to think is that these control layers can be doubled up on. In essence, one surface or one material might be a control layer and an air control, a water control layer and an air control layer all at the same time. Uh, so we break them out, but materials that we use to build with might combine those control layers into one material here. Uh, so again, we're breaking them out from an understanding perspective, uh, but a material that we buy and install in our houses might function both as the water control layer and the air control layer. So if we break the control layers down a little bit, we start with our cladding. It works to control water, but that cladding really is primarily a bulk water uh, layer, so we might have a belt and suspenders approach um, here by um, uh, ensuring that we have uh, a drainage gap behind that cladding uh, that that ultimately abuts the true water control layer that's allowing that water to drain down and out and away from our houses here. Then we have an air control layer, which is uh, constructed by the assembly of our air barrier system. It could be in, on the outside surface, it could be on the inside surface, or again, as code describes it, it's an assembly of things that create that air barrier in our houses. And then our vapor control layer, we're talking about vapor retarders, vapor barriers, uh, air, uh, vapor permeable products to promote uh, drying potential, potentially, all these things. And then our thermal control layer, um, all in, and these layers to the outside of our assemblies here. So why it works in a cold climate is that, um, again, the moisture is what destroys building and that repeated moisture, um, if we can gain control of it uh, by gaining control of the surface temperature and the relative humidity and the air leakage, uh, we've, we've uh, stopped the ability of that repeated wetting of our assemblies from happening um, there. Um, it turns out that it also works in a, in a warm climate uh, really for the same reasons um, there, that we're able to control the um, repeated wetting of our assemblies. It's just on the other side instead of on the, the outside portion or the inside portion. It, it depends on which of those first condensing surface, which side of the first condensing surface is going to be impacted by the repeated wetting uh, from a perfect wall perspective here. Now, we talked a little bit about this new study that came out, uh, and it's pertinent to bring back here because this new study indicated that a indoor relative humidity amount of uh, bet somewhere between 40 and 60 uh, percent relative humidity is potentially important for the health of, uh, of the occupants of that house. But on the flip side, it's, it could be pretty detrimental uh, for the structure itself. So we need to think about 
um, how we're going to balance occupant health and building health uh, in our new structures as well. And the perfect wall has an ability to do that if we, again, take into account systems thinking, apply building science, and marry this stuff with proper ventilation uh, in our homes as well there. Controlling the air leaks. Again, remember that air is that freight train, and we want to have that continuous air barrier and thermal uh, control layer. These, these control layers need to be continuous all the way around our house because uh, ultimately we can't control air until we enclose that air. Once we've enclosed the air, then we can use fans that take certain quantities of air out of our house and replace that same exact quantity with other air that's coming back into our house, whether it's being conditioned coming back in or is just coming back in based off of volume. Uh, we've gained control and predictability. We also potentially have the ability to condition that air, to filter it, and exchange uh, heat or moisture that's traveling in that air. So the code, again, helps us understand what air barriers are. Again, they're not just one component, generally speaking. They're an assembly of different things that come together to help define our building thermal envelope. And the code uh, follows that sound building science that says that we, have the that we have the continuity of that air barrier system inside of our house. So in its simplest form, our primary air barrier system we, on the inside of our houses is the continuity of drywall all the way around our houses. And that's why you see in the code uh, where the drywall isn't adjacent to the thermal boundary or thermal control layer of our houses, they often ask for a supplemental air barrier. So an air barrier installed behind a tub or an air barrier installed behind a piece of duct that's, in an, that's uh, adjacent to an exterior wall chase or a uh, ex, uh, additional air barrier in a fireplace assembly where the drywall would not be adjacent to uh, the thermal control layer here. Um, and then our exterior sheathing would be our primary exterior air barrier. And um, we might have other things like weather resistant barriers or other things installed that would help uh, supplement that primary air barrier, but might also be part of the water uh, control layer in our houses here. And that's why when we start talking about hash wraps and drainage planes and those things. So the ultimate function of the air barrier system, uh, if you're using fibrous insulation, is to enclose that insulation and, and limit the amount of air that's able to flow through it so we get the true R value of the material. And that's why you start hearing about the six-sided enclosed cavities in our assemblies. And then air control and thermal control and moisture control in our houses there. Now, if we're not going to build the perfect wall, how about the almost perfect wall uh, here? So why do people think about not doing the perfect wall? Well, there are cost issues, there's constructability issues, uh, potential material uh, uh, supply issues, other things. Uh, the difficulty of maintaining the continuity of all the control layers on the outside of the house uh, can, can pull into the equation here. Uh, so uh, we think about other ways to do that. And this, this particular assembly is using traditional cavity insulation with supplemental exterior foam sheathing here. It works ultimately because the structure itself is a wood structure. It has some R value and it's relatively non-conductive there. So we can raise that surface temperature uh, pretty easily by just putting foam sheathing on the outside, but we can get better energy performance, better comfort uh, by, and at a lower uh, cost potentially by just insulating the assemblies there. Um, we need to think about the vapor retarder or barrier uh, location and use in these this type of assembly, ensuring that we only use a class three re retarder on the inside so that we are able to ensure some drying potential uh, in these assemblies. And then we, we, we need to think about this idea of insulation ratio, uh, which is the ratio of the cavity insulation versus the continuous insulation on the outside of our assemblies. Um, to ensure that we get the right uh, ability 
to manage that first condensing surface temperature there. So the, 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 um, in these hybrid assemblies, uh, this type of hybrid assembly is using foam uh, in the assembly instead of foam board on the outside, it's using a closed cell foam inside of the assembly with a blown fiberglass uh, in the remainder of the cavity there. The cavity insulation uh, and the continuous insulation, we need to think about that ratio of those uh, two assemblies, which I'll show you here in a second. And we need to think about the materials that we're using in those assemblies so that that foam layer matches the R value that would normally be installed with the exterior foam sheathing. You need to have, have those match in that insulation ratio in order to control that condensing surface there and not just get consent, condensation on the backside of the closed cell foam itself here. Uh, it turns out that only closed cell foam meets the requirements of the IRC, uh, especially in uh, our colder climates. Uh, so we want to make sure that we're using the right material if you're going to use a hybrid wall assembly uh, versus the perfect wall. The problem assembly for a cold climates is an assembly that doesn't uh, think about how to manage that surface temperature of that first condensing surface. So it's a, an assembly that is just insulating the cavity, which ultimately cools that first condensing surface. So the water control layer is on the outside. Uh, the air control layer is is on the inside. The outside, it's you know, it's this assembly of things that's on uh, kind of both sides of the assembly. The vapor control layers on the inside and the thermal control layer is in the middle of this assembly, which means that the cavity side of our exterior sheathing, which is generally OSB, is going to be cold. And if moisture gets into that assembly, we have a high potential for condensation uh, to, to uh, uh, build up in that assembly. And therefore, it's what we call this problem assembly for our climates here. So where does the, the R value go? So the code itself uh, tells us that the R value should go to the exterior in these colder climates. So, and we have to think about the relationship between the R value that we're putting on the outside and the vapor retarder that we're putting on the inside. So this table says that if I'm going to put R value on the outside, I am allowed to put a class three vapor retarder on the inside. So I promote drying potential to the inside and I reduce the potential for condensation on that first condensing surface there. So the wall value ratio helps us understand, uh, and this is what the code is using to determine the, the um, R value of that continuous insulation versus the cavity insulation there. So this table uh, has been created to help us determine in, in each climate zone, what's the ratio of cavity insulation versus continuous insulation. And in climate zone five, uh, it turns out that it's a 30% ratio of cavity and continuous insulation um, there. And as you get higher um, up in the different climate zones, you know, you're getting to climate zone eight, where it's basically 50-50 uh, for, the, for the most part there. So you, you're, um, it's a 50% ratio. Uh, so you're going to get, you know, super insulated structures uh, in order to not uh, get condensation on that first condensing surface there. R values. So let's uh, think about R values here. R values, again, describe a material's ability to resist the heat flow. Uh, from higher concentrations to uh, um, lower concentrations. We have the nominal R value of the material itself, the R value that's installed in the cavity. That's kind of the labeled R value of a, of a bat or uh, the designed R value of a density filled uh, material that we put into our, our, our building cavities. And then we have the total R value uh, of the assembly as well. And the R value of the assembly is created by a weighted R value of all the layers of material that creates that assembly there. Uh, it can include windows, but from a modeling perspective, we generally uh, take out windows uh, from, from the assembly and we, we subtract that area out of the wall. 
So I wanted to give you an example, and this is without Windows in the example, because this comes, out, comes directly from a modeling software called Ecotrope. So if I build my layers here, I have sheetrock, I have a fiberglass bat that I entered at um, R20 in a 16 inch on center framed cavity, uh, OSB on the outside, a weather resistant barrier and siding on the structure. Uh, I have some stud cavity um, framing factor, which is shown on the right hand side of this slide. And I get a total assembly um, R value of 17 versus the installed cavity R value of 20. So the studs uh, and the other mem members, framing members and, and assembly members here are reducing the overall assembly R value of this cavity here. Uh, so it's it's pretty interesting when we say, oh yeah, I use, I use uh, blown cellulose and it's a uh, R20 wall. Well, the reality is it's not an R20 wall or it's not an R23 wall. It's something less than that if we think of it from an assembly perspective here. Um, that's the framing factor that just showed up uh, there that I was talking about. Now, here's another example. Uh, this is an R20. Uh, and in this case, we're using an R20 cavity with an R5 continuous insulation. And you can see how the total assembly um, R value jumped up pretty substantially from 17 to almost R23 uh, in the assembly there. So continuous insulation can have a pretty big impact in the total uh, performance of our home, as well as the assembly of, uh, performance and mitigating that first condensing surface there. When we do put foam sheathings in particular on the outside of our houses, we need to think a little bit about this notion of thermal drift. So our, our three main uh, insulators on the outside are expanded polystyrene, the kind of that coffee cup white foam, polyiso isanerate and extruded polystyrene, we call XPS. Um, all of these foams are blown uh, and created with a blowing agent and that blowing agent generally um, releases or off gases over time. Uh, so there will be a slight reduction over time uh, of the R value of these foams, but then it generally uh, uh, reaches a steady state uh, value over time. And, you know, to be, well, I guess in this case, after 15 years, it shows the polyisocenterate uh, R value at approximately 6.5, I guess. There. Um, okay, um, the other material that we're starting to see as an exterior foam sheathing or exterior, it's not really exterior foam sheathing, it's an exterior foam or ex an exterior insulation product is rock wool. Now rock wool uh, is air permeable. So I have a bit of question or I need to have better understanding of how it works on the exterior of our building uh, if air is able to move through it. So in essence, I believe that the cladding materials that we're putting over the rock wall uh, there and the density of the rock wall is limiting the true impact of, of a small amount of air that's moving through that material in the same way that a ventilated attic and insulation in that ventilated attic, uh, the impact of that ventilation air is has a small impact on the insulation there as well. So I believe that's what's what's happening in these assemblies. So when we continue to talk about this total wall R value assembly, uh, we need to think about how we're ultimately building this assembly and what is the total R value. So the, the picture on the left here is showing a two by six wall, 16 inch on center that's insulated with an R21 bat and R3 windows. So the, the window component here is really what's dry, dropping that R value from the previous example from the modeling software. So we get a whole wall bar, R value of about nine in that assembly on the left. If I move this assembly to a two, two by six wall that's 24 inches on center, I increase the total wall R value to 9.6. So not, not a huge amount, but there is some significant increase in, in efficiency just by changing my framing technique. Now this uh, 
change here is taking that same wall, um, but I've added continuous insulation uh, here. So an R6 continuous insulation on um, the picture on the left take, took it to an 11.5 and an R9 took it to a 12.2 uh, on the picture on the right here. Uh, so wall R value, again, can, can increase the efficiency of that assembly uh, pretty dramatically here. Now the total wall R value uh, in these equations uh, are demonstrating um, even better Im improvement here because I have that two by six wall uh, with an R21 bat, uh, R6 continuous insulation in the picture on the left, but I've, add, I've increased the performance of the window from an R3 window to an R5 window in this case. Uh, so it took it to a, a, a 14 R value overall assembly R value for that wall in the two by six 24 inch on center wall <clears throat> it took it to an r18 uh, assembly so we wanted to show you the impact of exterior sheathing as well as window performance there as well um, so <clears throat> the windows have a large impact and again thinking about that window as the largest uh, deficiency in our whole assembly it makes a lot of sense to uh, consider using a higher quality window in our assembly. The window itself in that example has about the same impact as just moving from uh, 16 inch on center to 24 inch on center. So it's a pretty big impact. So our biggest bang for the buck in this equation of thinking about how we're gonna put our assemblies together is to think about that glazing percentage that we're doing that. So when we're thinking about great glazing percentage, we're thinking about the window to wall ratio. And we're seeing our houses go way beyond a 15% window to wall ratio. A 15% window to wall ratio is what is used in uh, the performance pass of the IECC uh, to help demonstrate compliance. So the reference homes are, are benchmarked at 15%. And what we know is that if when you go beyond 15% window to wall ratio, you start really degrading the to total overall assembly R value uh, pretty significantly. So uh, one of the things you can do in your design process is ensure that you don't go above 15% and in some ways try to think about how to go get less windows in into those assemblies. It's a very difficult thing because uh, obviously our home buyers love windows uh, and our architects love windows. Uh, the next thing to think about is air tightness, getting our house as tight as we possibly can. Obviously, we want to get below three air changes from a code perspective, but the tighter, the better. And we, you know, significant amount of energy moves out of our houses with air. So we want to lower that, that air leakage rate. And then insulating our houses uh, properly, uh, get, get a good R value, uh, move a portion or all of that R value to the exterior. Uh, so, so either use a mixture of cavity and exterior insulation or take it all the way uh, to the exterior, but uh, max out your R value as well. Um, the last thing I wanted to say about windows is uh, these triple pane windows are becoming way, way more affordable. Their performance is outstanding compared to a typical double glazed window. Um, however, if uh, some of their performance is coming by adding gas uh, to the unit between the different layers of glass, and if you're taking, if that window is built uh, at low altitude and you're taking it to high altitude, uh, there is question still about its um, ability to um, still have that gas inside the window and what is its, what's the impact uh, on the overall R value. It's still gonna be better than a typical double glazed window, but it might not be its rated R value or U value anymore. So think about that. Uh, we need to continue our conversation about moisture here and understand vapor retarders a little bit because uh, we've got to ensure that that wetting of our assemblies isn't going to destroy our assemblies and that we promote drying mechanisms over wetting mechanisms inside of our houses. So vapor retarders in general are used to stop or retard the migration of moisture uh, inside, our, inside our cavities. And unfortunately, it can also 
uh, retard or mitigate the ability of moisture that does get into our cavities from getting back out as well. So materials that would be considered a vapor retarder are a lot of the materials that we use to build with. And as we layer materials on, we tend to increase or decrease the permeability of, of those materials from a water uh, diffusion perspective. Assemblies um, need to have drying potential. Um, I like to use the term drying potential, but the reality is it means the same thing as breathing. Our assemblies need to be able to dry. Um, I don't like the notion of breathing, but drying is, is what we should, is how we really should be talking about it there. And which means that we should never put a vapor retarder on both sides of the assembly. And that's ultimately what's happened on these pictures on the right. Uh, this, these are pictures from the south, southeast, uh, some motels where they put uh, vapor retarders on both sides of the assembly because the wallpaper they put on the interior turned out to also be a vapor retarder here. Just to define some terms a little bit, vapor, the vapor control layer, this is the element that is designed and installed in our assembly to retard the movement of water by vapor diffusion here. A perm is the unit of measurement typically used to characterize the water permeance of a material, basically how much water moisture can move through a material by the process of diffusion. A perm rating is the unit telling us the mass, mass rate of water vapor flowing through a square foot of material. And in the U.S., we use a perm, and it's defined as one grain of water per hour per square foot per inch per mercury moving through the material. The higher the perm rating, the more water can move through that material. And again, a vapor retarder is re defined as a material that is one perm or less or greater than 0 0.1 perm um, there. So we should have a pretty good understanding how that works now. Vapor retarders in the IECC um, take you to the IRC, uh, the section R7. 02.7 is where it is in the IRC here. It says that we have to use a class one or two vapor retarder in climate zones five, six, seven, and eight, where we're building in these cold climates here. Um, but uh, there is an exception. And the exception begins with basements or in any foundation wall uh, there. Uh, we shouldn't be using a class one or two vapor retarder. Below grade portions of any wall or construction where moisture or its freezings will not damage the materials. We also can move to a class three vapor retarder if we use um, the insulation ratios as described in table R702.7.1, which I'll show you in a second. So these vapor control layers are, are these are the materials and assemblies and talking about their ability to limit the amount of water diffusion through our assemblies here. Um, so again, the code often talks more about, or in historically has talked more about how do we control vapor diffusion versus how do we control moisture that's moving with air. So historically, um, air leakage really has only been concentrated on from a code perspective uh, since the 2012 IECC, when it became a mandatory air leakage test. And it's primarily from an energy efficiency perspective, not a building durability perspective. So um, we, we have to understand the building science to understand that we want to move our assemblies away from using class one and two vapor retarders and uh, to using more class three vapor retarders because it turns out that we're not perfect at creating an airtight assembly and therefore moisture is getting into our assemblies by air leakage at a much larger rate than it is getting in by vapor diffusion here. Uh, but if you do build any basements, make sure that you're not covering that basement with a class one or two vapor retarder. Uh, this is one example of a material that's been uh, changed, in essence, uh, to, be, ha to create some permeability in the product. So this product has now about a 10 perm, uh, which moves it out of a class one uh, range here. So 
this is a vinyl faced fiberglass that's been perforated so that it still maintains its ability to act as an air barrier to enclose uh, that fibrous insulation, but it allows moisture to diffuse through these little pinholes uh, in the material there as well. A class one vapor retarder, an example of that would be a polyethylene sheet or this foil faced non perforated product. Uh, a class two vapor retarder would be something like a craft faced bat. A craft faced bat is an interesting material because it acts much like a Gore Tex jacket. It allows moisture to move and, and diffuse in one direction from inside to outside, but it, it uh, stops moisture through the paper side of the material uh, to move. Uh, into that a cavity by the process of diffusion. And a class three vapor tartar is as simple as two coats of latex paint uh, on your wall. Uh, so we like class three vapor tartars um, there. So this is the table that we looked at before that shows um, if you want to use a class three vapor tartar, then and you have to do something on the exterior of your wall. You either have to do a vented cladding um, or you have to do an insulated sheathing on the outside to promote that drying potential uh, to the outside as well as to the inside of our assembly. So we have a more forgiving assembly that in essence can dry in both directions here. So in order to get that vented opening, however, um, the code says that uh, you have to include a minimum clear airspace, but the problem with the code is it doesn't define what that clear what that minimum clear airspace is supposed to be. It gives you some examples of minimum clear airspaces, but it doesn't clearly say that three sixteenths of an inch is all you need because three sixteenths of an inch is equivalent to about twenty air changes per hour behind your siding. And there's a variety of ways that you can achieve that that small gap. Uh, between your siding and your water control layer so that you get the ability for air to move uh, behind that siding and dry any moisture that's diffusing out, uh, but also gives an air gap for moisture to drain down and out and away from the assembly there. So rain screens are super important to start considering adding to your assemblies if you're not there. And interestingly enough, there's a brand new association that's been been created uh, rain screen screen association out there uh, we're hopeful that they'll be sending out and creating lots of great documentation that that we can learn from here but uh, it's so new that i don't even i can't even give you the acronym or the actual name of the association at this point um, if you are forced to put a class one vapor retarder in your assembly Consider a smart vapor retarder like CertainTeed's membrane. There are a couple different on the product. This also acts similar to a Gore-Tex jacket, stopping moisture uh, from moving from the outside in. But if there's moisture inside the cavity, it has the ability to dry back out uh, through that cavity there. So how do we stop diffusion? Well, unfortunately, uh, we'll have to stop building before we can stop diffusion but we have to remember that diffusion is a small pathway of moisture transport versus air leakage. Uh, we, have to, we have to manage it, but we also need to manage uh, air leakage and the moisture that's moving with air. Therefore, we have to have the continuity of our air barrier system. We have to have strength, durability, stiffness, and ultimately impermeability of that air barrier system and that control layer in our house to ensure that we're not getting overrun with moisture in those assemblies. And then we need to build forgiving assemblies that encourage drying mechanisms over wetting mechanisms. Avoid using vapor retarders where or vapor barriers, true barriers where retarders will work. Avoid using vapor retarders where vapor permeable materials work. And avoid the installation of vapor barriers on both sides of, of our assemblies like vinyl wall coverings would be an example of that. And then ultimately encourage ventilation in our assemblies and our houses so that we get that background uh, moisture control in those assemblies um, there. Uh, so we, we, we know what we need to do. It's really the implementation of it and uh, the design and uh, uh, integration part of it that we're still working on. Because we don't do these things well, 
again, that becomes super important to think, how can we design this out of our assembly? Uh, a true class one vapor retarder, if installed properly, will actually keep moisture out of our assemblies by diffusion and also by air leakage potentially. Uh, but it means we have to overlap the seams and seal it. We have to have flanged and potentially airtight boxes uh, and seal the vapor retarder to that. Uh, we need to seal it to the openings, to our bottom plates, to our top plates, and we need to install it continuously around our building envelope. And if we don't, moisture will get behind those and it will get trapped and it will cause problems as is shown in this picture here. So what can we do? We can look at these assemblies that we want to build with, and we can look at vapor profile mapping in these assemblies. It's a method to determine the relative drying potential of our building assembly. It's based on vapor permeance of each layer in the assembly, and it's generally uh, run through a four-step process in order to figure that uh, out here. So first of all, we need to determine the vapor permeance of all, all the materials that are making up our assembly. We can attain that uh, information by looking at product manufacturers testing data for the ASTM E96 data, going to websites like Building Science Corp's website and looking at these property tables that some uh, folks have started to create um, there as well. Then we need to assign the vapor permeance to each layer of the material and, and determine, is it vapor open? Is it a class three retarder, a class two, two retarder, or a class one retarder? Ultimately, how, how does it rank there? And then assess the direction of the prevailing vapor drive. Is it more from the inside out or the outside in? Uh, and um, how many occupants are in that house? How is it expected to live? Um, all these things need to be assessed in order to figure out uh, the, the vapor profile of our assemblies. And then we identify ultimately the least vapor permeable material. In this case, uh, the least vapor permeable material is the XPS rigid foam in this assembly. We determine if that component restricts the drying of moisture sensitive components that are on either side of that assembly and, and depending on the drive, the, the predominant moisture drive in our particular climate. Uh, we seek the most drying potential that we can, so we might move uh, away from class one or two vapor retarders if we're going to have a super moisture uh, uh, a component of the assembly that is super moisture permea impermeable in that assembly here. Uh, so we need to assess that. Uh, in this case, um, we have some drying potential uh, to the inside with the Lightex paint. Uh, so it's not as uh, big a deal in potentially uh, a cold climate um, there. But again, it needs to be assessed with the assemblies that we are designing with. Ultimately, what we'll learn is we'll get more information uh, and be able to make more informed uh, decisions about the drying potential of our assemblies to determine the direction that dry driving uh, drying potential is taking. Uh, based off of that vapor profile that we've created here. We're able to limit uh, drying potential uh, so that it doesn't create a failure uh, in our assemblies. Uh, and we are going to ultimately promote uh, drying over wetting in our assemblies by asking these types of questions. How much moisture will an assembly see? How much sun will it see? Um, is is our are our control layers been have they been designed properly with all the components that are making that assembly here? The vapor permeance of foam thickness we need to remember is in, inversely proportional to the thickness of that material there. So if I'm going to use uh, uh, foam sheathing, I, I need to think about how thick that foam sheathing is and how that ultimately changes the permeability of the material that I want to use. So I might get some benefit from an increased R value of the material, but there might be a detriment uh, to choosing that material from a vapor permeable perspective if I haven't taken that into account here.
So spray in place foams are foams that can be used uh, in our assemblies, but we need to think about which one to use in our colder climates. So the differences between closed cell and open cell foam are quickly known just by touching the materials. Closed cell is hard to the touch. Uh, open cell is soft to the touch. Uh, closed cell is uh, moisture impermeable if you get um, about two inches of the material installed, uh, whereas uh, open cell foam moisture impermeability at five and a half inches, so you need a lot more uh, there. It also doesn't work well over 45 uh, 100 heating degree days at five and a half inches there. So that's a pretty big difference. It's air permeable, uh, closed cell at one and a half inches, where open cell, you need three and a half inches. The R values are pretty different with the two materials, but the cost of install is comparable. So I think that's a big driver in, in your choice. Uh, the density is different, and that's what drives the R value. Um, both require the installation uh, by a trained installer uh, for those materials. But as we'll see moving forward, uh, only closed cell spray foam works and is allowed by code in certain, in certain situations uh, in our cold climates here. So the perfect assembly, we talked about the wall assemblies there. Uh, if we think about a wall and we lay it flat, then we have a uh, perfect roof. And if we flip that over, we'll have a perfect slab. Uh, so at, from that starting point, we can think about other ways to build. But if you have that starting reference point in your uh, mindset, when you're designing the assemblies, you're trying to ultimately get as close to perfection as you can based off of cost and other potential uh, reasons why you would move away from the perfect assembly there. Uh, the control layers, it's perfect, obviously, from a roof perspective, because the control layers are under the insulation and outside the structure there. So everything's to the outside there. Most critical control layers um, are protected by UV light or from UV light, heat, and water. And the downside, ultimately, is that those co control layers um, uh, aren't easy re to replace, and therefore you have to be really uh, cautious when you're replacing the roof assembly or the roof uh, protected layers there as well there. Now, one thing that we often like to do that's allowed by the IRC and the ICC basically points you to the IRC are unvented attic uh, assemblies or enclosed rafter uh, assemblies here. So you can either have an attic or a rafter that are completely controlled. Uh, they shall be permitted if the following conditions are met. So there are these four conditions that have to be met, and we're going to uh, break them down uh, a little bit more and under, try to understand what these four things are. So first, you must have a continuous air control layer as part of any unvented attic or roof assembly that you're creating there. The unvented roof assembly generally has a top side to the ambient outside and elements that are class one vapor retarders on that or at that location. Therefore, you wanna really be sure you're not putting a class one vapor retarder on the inside of that assembly because we ultimately don't wanna trap moisture in that assembly, Some kind of similar to uh, the vinyl wallpaper that we talked about earlier there. The roof cladding made out of wood requires special attention to drying because that drying that material uh, like roof shingles or something like that, uh, really require a great drying potential. So you'll have some other type of ventilation under them. Cold climate unvented roof assemblies need greater attention in order to control heat, sir, heat moisture, and airflow uh, in, in and out of that unvented part of the assembly there. Uh, it's super important that we keep what we want out of those assemblies and what we want in those assemblies if there's anything that we want in those. Uh, so, and the reason I say it that way is because attics are slightly different than roofs. If I'm doing a raftered roof, unvented roof assembly, I wanna pretty much keep everything out of it. But it, from an attic perspective, um, I might have to ventilate that attic in order to control the, the moisture buildup that would happen at that highest surface in my house um, there. So there's five conditions for air permeable insulation. 
in the assembly here. And so if we break that down, what does these five conditions actually mean? It basically says that air permeable insulation is the only type of insulation that's allowed to be installed in direct contact with the underside of the roof deck there. So we get a control layer uh, and to ensure that we're not getting uh, moisture laden air uh, potentially condensing against that, that roof deck from the house side there. In mixed assemblies, uh, some where you have some uh, moisture in and some moisture out, uh, these conditions talk about what you need in that situation. So it's not saying that you can only uh, put the, all the insulation on the inside. You can not only have to put all the insulation on the outside, you can do a mixed assembly as well. And the code actually gives you guidance in two different mixed assemblies, three different mixed assemblies uh, that you can choose from how you're going to uh, correctly install this material to make it work at. So you can choose uh, the assembly that you want, uh, and you can even choose the perfect proof, perfect roof where all of the insulation is moved to the outside of the assembly there uh, to create that conditioned or unventilated uh, assembly there. Conditioned by meaning the conditioned attic versus the unventilated uh, assembly there. Your options here, closed cell foam is air permeable insulation in the framing cavity. It can create an air, bar air barrier and a vapor barrier. Rigid insulations you can put above the roof deck. They're air permeable insulations uh, in the framing cavity. So you have a choice of doing um, closed cell foam in the whole cavity. You have a, a choice of doing a little bit of each on each side of the cavity. Uh, you can put closed cell and air, air permeable insulation together inside the cavity. Or again, you can go to that perfect assembly where you're putting all the insulation to the outside. And there's lots of resources uh, to help you figure out which one you, or basically how to execute the one that you choose. Uh, but these work well in our cold climates, and that's why they're ultimately uh, being talked about here. But we also have to, just like we think about the insulation ratios to ensure that we're protecting, protecting that first condensing surface, we need to think about the, the ratios from the perspective of our roof, roof insulation inside the cavity and outside. We also have another choice, which is to build a cold roof assembly. This is a fully vented roof assembly, kind of a belt and suspenders approach. It helps create an airtight vapor. Uh, it's help, I'm sorry, you're, we're helping to create it by using an airtight vapor and permeable foam. So generally that closed cell foam, but also including a continuous ventilation uh, space from our soffit vent all the way to a ridge vent in that assembly uh, to make sure that we're keeping our assemblies um, on the outside at, at that outside temperature. And we're not going to get any ice damming or, or other condensation uh, built up in those assemblies. The cold roof, again, helps avoid us, helps avoid us from trapping moisture on the roof deck. It keeps the roof deck at that cold temperature. It provides drying ability while limiting snow melting, which helps prevent ice dams. And there's a particular kind of mixture of uh, assembly here that we look for when we're talking about a cold roof assembly that includes that continuous air space to keep that surface temperature the same as the ambient surface temperature there. We can do vapor profile mapping on our roof assemblies in the same way that we can do on our cold roofs. Again, we're trying to promote that excellent drying potential of those assemblies there. From a foundation perspective, we think of our foundations as, as obviously the foundation that holds up the building. It resists that soil pressure, and but it has a lot of water management uh, issues as well from keeping groundwater out, soil gases and water vapor out of our assemblies um, there. So we want to ensure that we think about our foundation assemblies as well and how we're going to insulate those, uh, those assemblies as well. We can insulate from the outside. We get great, pretty good thermal control from the outside and we bring the mass 
of the concrete assembly into the conditioned space of the house. Uh, when you use XPS ins insulation, it helps resist vapor diffusion. Uh, it can be a capillary break at the footing as well, um, at least at that portion that it's covering uh, as well. So it's something to think about. But there are some constructability issues uh, with it. Um, pretend, and generally, it's that portion of the EPX foam board on the outside that's sticking up above grade. And you can see in this uh, diagram that they have uh, put a protective board over it with a proper flashing detail. But uh, often that, that portion above grade gets uh, hammered pretty hard during the construction process, the backfill process. Uh, so you wanna get that protection on there as soon as possible there. You can insulate, uh, you can use insulated concrete forms, which uh, is a, a great system as well. Uh, you have two layers of XPS, usually foam. Uh, get a, an R value in that R20 range. So you get a, a significant amount of increased R value. You do have that same issue of protecting the insulation from the outside uh, during construction. Uh, moisture related issues, they're, they're small uh, with this particular product, but there are some constructability issues that uh, people have found using this material. Foam, foam board and bad insulation on the inside, you wanna use the right uh, type of foam board, usually an expanded polystyrene uh, is the best foam board to use on the inside because it has the most uh, permeability from a drying perspective. So remember, you don't wanna put a true vapor barrier uh, or true vapor retarder over that concrete wall uh, on the inside. You wanna promote that drying potential, uh, but this, this combination material works really well. It's also done uh, generally after backfill and other things that are happening on the outside. So you're not, it's constructability is, is a lot easier uh, when you're insulating from the inside versus from the outside of the assembly. It turns out that a closed foam uh, application is one of the best and less le leaky, um, I'm sorry, less ri riskiest uh, type of assembly and approach. Uh, in our cold climate. So that's something that you can um, see, see done here. I've only seen it uh, done once uh, in Climate Zone 5, and it was actually in Climate Zone 5 uh, outside of Boston, but um, it, it seemed to work uh, really well, and it is something that you could consider for that particular assembly there. Slabs are also something that we need to think about. Remember that you could take that perfect wall and flip it over and you have those control layers to the outside of the structure uh, in the same way as you would with the wall and a roof assembly, uh, and it works and works well. Uh, you have to remember to have that, that uh, additional control layer with the gravel underneath so that you have uh, air and moisture, uh, for a place for air and moisture to move so that you can collect it potentially and move it away and out of the assembly there. Uh, we, we are concerned about insulating these uh, slabs and slab edges properly there. Uh, so we want to make sure that we're getting that surface temperature uh, increase so that we're not getting condensation at that cold surface temperature. So uh, there are ways to insulate from the outside and from the inside, uh, potentially using the uh, foam board as an expansion joint. If you're using a footing and slab uh, type process to create your, your uh, slab foundation there. Uh, we're seeing a lot of walkout basements that create walkout slab edges. Uh, so again, that uh, foam used as a, an expansion joint uh, is a great option there. And that's shown on the pictures on the left. Uh, the picture on the right is showing insulating on the outside. Uh, the picture in the middle, again, is showing uh, insulating from the inside and a slab would ultimately be poured uh, there or that might, that could be a foundation uh, for a crawl space as well um, there. So basically we have three components here of this slab edge. We have the stem wall to footing and we have under slab. So you need to figure out in the particular assembly you're using which components need to be insulated um, there. Uh, generally speaking, at a minimum, you want to insulate that slab edge 
and you want to insulate that slab edge from the sill plate down to the footing. Uh, depending on other things, then you might move to insulating uh, underneath the slab as well in order to increase uh, the comfort or increase performance of hydronic systems that might be embedded in the slab, other things like that. When you're doing uh, slab edge insulation, you also need to think about separating or creating a thermal break between adjacent slabs. So in this case, we have an adjacent slab of a porch on this picture on the left here that was not separated. Uh, so it's a PT slab that is poured all in one uh, pour, uh, and they didn't get a thermal break. So that that's porch acts as a thermal sink and is continuously pulling energy from the house, making that house much more uncomfortable. Whereas the center picture, you can see the thermal break. They've separated the entry porch from the house and then out in the back there, the garage from the house slab as well has been completely separated with the thermal break there. So that's important to do. You can also insulate on top of slabs. Uh, this is often done from a retrofit perspective, but in new construction, you can do that as well uh, and, and get a break between the slab and the house um, there. So that's something to consider as well. So the last thing that we need to consider is where assemblies uh, collide here. So these problems occur where different assemblies intersect. So when we're talking about control and predictability, look at where these assemblies connect together uh, as points of uh, and points where issues will be created. So at roof wall connections, in this case, you know, it's a reversed flash. It's not flashed properly. Moisture is going to be directed into the assembly here. Uh, where foundations and, and framing begin uh, are big issues. Uh, where drywall meets the top plate are big air leakage issues. So again, we're talking about controlling moisture flow, airflow, thermal flow, uh, windows, uh, connections, flashing here, big things to consider. So when you're, when you're designing your assemblies, make sure that you're looking at uh, these connection points in particular and how you're going to address those connection points. Uh, another one to think about is the perfect wall to the perfect roof and the continuity of those control layers. How are you going to bend and get, get continuity from your wall up into your roof assembly so you have a continuous and a contiguous uh, control layer for all water, uh, moisture, thermal, all of those different control layers there. Because remember, the code is asking us to have that continuous um, air barrier and it's defined in the code. Uh, they're also uh, ensuring that we understand that the air barrier is an assembly of things in our houses. And it becomes a mandatory requirement uh, through this table and the code uh, programs like Energy Star have adopted this, this table in essence. Uh, so it's a mandatory requirement of those programs as well. You can get an idea of how well you're doing with the continuity of your control layers by doing the red line test. Put your, your pen on your drawing, draw all the way around the perimeter of your assemblies and try not to lift your pen off the paper to see if you can get that continuity there and then transfer that knowledge out into the field here. Now, there is a, another group that I wanted to tell you quickly about, the Applied Building Technologies Resource Group. Uh, they have a wall calculator uh, to, to help you uh, determine if your R values are meeting codes, uh, but more importantly, to help you with this um, uh, R value ratio uh, here. So you can type in your uh, building components, your assembly components into this calculator here, and they can help you understand if you have the R value ratios properly to avoid that first condensing surface in your assembly. So lastly, we want to talk real quick about this integrated design process and ensure that we're um, thinking about the climate and the systems and how the building is going to be used and designed uh, early on in our process here, because change is hard and we're being asked to build a more efficient structure than we have in, in the past. We might, some of us might have some uh, starting point that is closer to the ultimate goal of zero energy ready. Uh, some might not, uh, but no matter what, all of us are going to have to change what we're 
we're doing a little bit. So we need to start early in this process. We need to think about how do we integrate all the opportunities that we have to bring down cost and get things uh, installed in the way that we need them so that the, the components are not only there, but they're installed so that they're actually working uh, to better that house is. So we want to be able to integrate applied building science and systems thinking to get air control, thermal control, and moisture control. And then ultimately, we have to meet the code requirements and the program requirements to meet the code um, there as well. So if we're defining our project objective, objective of meeting the DOE Zero Energy Ready Home Program, we need to figure out how we're going to integrate the four programs, which are the ICC components of the program, the Energy Star components, the Indoor Air Plus components, and the DOE Zero Energy Ready additional components of that program to get the holistic integration of there. We need to figure out how we're going to share the responsibilities and bring in the right teams to be successful. We need to view things holistically from that applied building science and systems thinking perspective, inform our trade partners and share uh, the research materials and building practices early in the process so that they know what they're being asked to do, why they're being asked to do it, and how to successfully uh, make it happen here. And ultimately, as we talked earlier, the object is integrating our structure, our systems, our components in the particular climate that we're building in so that the occupants of these houses uh, have the house of their dreams and that they're going to work and be code compliant here. And when we do that, we'll get, get houses that perform and perform super well here. Wow, I, I did it. I got it all in uh, before three o'clock. Thanks so much for uh, spending these last six weeks with me. Um, I know it's been a lot of materials and there, there probably will be questions that come up uh, after words, you can go back and listen to these recorded webinars as much as you like. Uh, they will be posted. And also, you're more than welcome to reach out to me and ask uh, questions as well. Excellent. Thank you so much, Robbie. There was a lot of information, but it was all really useful. Um, I do want to just take these last few minutes and, and um, open it up for questions if anyone would like to unmute themselves or type something in the chat box while we've got Robbie here with us in person. All right, well, Robbie and I will hang out for another minute, um, but if you don't have a question, thanks so much for joining us. Like he mentioned, um, all of the webinars are posted on um, a website hosted by the Colorado Energy Office, so you'll get a link to that uh, after, in, in shortly, probably likely tomorrow, um, from Erica DeLello with Noresco. Um, and just, yeah, make note of Robbie's email address if you have any questions later. Robbie, we did have one come in. Can you briefly talk about zip R panels, uh, which place the air barrier sheathing and WRB on the outside of the insulation? Yeah, um, it seems like the zip R product is a um, very popular product right now uh, because it does exactly what you said and potentially um, reduces the construction time and is a and is a system that doesn't replace um, or change the way that things are currently being framed and, and installed. It makes it simpler in that process. Um, the only thing that I've heard with regards to, to zip bar sheathing is that um, sometimes the nails will get overdriven when you're using a nail gun to install that product. So you have to be really conscious about 
going back and putting a liquid or taped applied um, barrier over the nail heads uh, to, to ensure that uh, moisture isn't going to get inside or, or inside the, the OSB panel or the foam product there. And that overdriven nail tends to be a little bit more susceptible in the zip bar sheathing because of the foam on the back of it. Uh, but it's also um, happening with normal zip bar without the uh, normal zip panels without the foam on the back of it as well. Uh, I've seen a lot of folks be really successful. Uh, zip has a uh, liquid applied putty that has a, uh, it's basically installed. It comes in like a sausage tube and is installed with a um, caulking type gun. And uh, people have been really successful at using that for the nail heads as well as the joints between uh, the panels as well, and rather than relying on the tape product. Okay, if we have no further questions, I think we're gonna go ahead and end the webinar. I see people leaving. Um, so thanks again to all of you for joining us and um, looking forward, oh wait, we got another one. Bobby, is your understanding of the continuous insulation component of the IECC chart that it could be anywhere in the wall assembly? Yes. It doesn't necessarily mean uh, it has to be in the cavity. It, it can be, yes. I guess the, the easiest way to answer it is yes. Okay. Any final thoughts? I don't want to cut anyone else off. I guess I'll just add one one thing, Jess, is that from that last question, I think what uh, they might be getting at is that um, the the code really is talking about the continuous insulation as a means to raise the surface temperature of that first condensing surface so it is looking at that insulate that continuous insulation to be on the outside of the assembly um i know it doesn't happen very often but sometimes people put that continuous insulation on the inside of the assembly uh sometimes with roof structures or whatnot um, but the idea here is to um, get that uh, continuous insulation to the outside. Yeah, so um, so I, I'm just reading the question here. It says, right, either double studs or an interior wall eliminating thermal bridging. So there's two things that are happening with continuous insulation. From a code perspective, it's really talking about continuous insulation that's raising the surface temperature of the first condensing surface. The code is not necessarily concerned about the thermal bridging benefit of continuous insulation. So in essence, the code is silence, silent on double stud walls that, are, that add a continuous uh, insulated portion in, inside the wall assembly or putting uh, uh, interior continuous insulation on the wall there. It would be silent on that. It's not gonna say you can't do it. It's not gonna say you can do it, uh, but it doesn't necessarily help you from that condensation perspective. All right, great. Thank you, Robbie, for answering those questions. 
I am going to go ahead and end the webinar. Um, like I mentioned, it will be posted online. You've got Robbie's contact information here. So thanks for all of you for hanging in there to the end and for, and for your great questions. We appreciate it. And thank you, Robbie, for a great series. Much appreciated. Thank you, everyone. Take care.